Hello and welcome to this video on theories of the family, feminism and personal life perspective. Feminism is a conflict perspective, so in a sense it is similar to Marxism in so much that it is of the opinion that at the heart of society there is a conflict between different groups. For feminists, that's going to be between different genders, namely male and female. They take a critical view of the family. They argue that the family is an institution which oppresses women. They do not regard gender inequality as natural, but as socially constructed. That is to say, there's nothing biological about the inequality that exists between men and women in terms of power in our society. Rather, it's something that we have created as a society. It is socially constructed. Feminism is in fact an umbrella term for many different types or strands of feminism and in particular we're going to look at liberal Marxist and radical feminism. We will also consider difference feminism before moving on to the personal life perspective. Liberal feminism in many ways is the most mainstream form of feminism. It is concerned with campaigning against sex discrimination and for equal rights and equal opportunities for women. And in particular, they would point to several changes to the law which help to express this idea that women's oppression is gradually being overcome. So first and foremost, the Sex Discrimination Act of 1975. Previous to this, women were often ignored or their applications for jobs were put over in lieu of men simply by virtue of the fact that they were women and that was considered acceptable up until the point that this law was introduced. We then have the Equal Pay Act of 1970. Again, up until this point, it was completely acceptable for businesses to have policies whereby they paid women less than men, even in the same role, even with the same qualifications, simply because they are women. We then also have the Equal Franchise Act of 1928. This was when women were given the opportunity to vote uh, on the same pegging as with men. Previous to that, some women could vote, but it was very, very marginal or heavily restricted. And to an extent, there were also some restrictions on men voting too. And so it's 1928 where finally there is universal suffrage. Liberal feminists would argue that we're moving towards greater equality, but this depends on further reforms. So more still needs to be done. We need to also change attitudes towards women and towards equality between the genders and socialization patterns, the way we bring up little boys and little girls. Generally, liberal feminists take a march of progress view, so they feel that things are improving, progressing and becoming more equal and fair, but do not feel true equality has yet been achieved. There's still more to be done. That said, they would recognize the fact that increasingly children are being socialized in a more equal manner and say that this is going to help play a part in the improvement of affairs for women. They are criticised, however, by other feminists for not challenging underlying causes of women's oppression and instead simply saying, if we change the law, things will get better. It's only a matter of time. And so for other feminists, they would say we need to do a little bit more and be perhaps a little bit more radical. Marxist feminists are slightly more radical than liberal feminists, and they would argue that the main source of women's oppression is, in fact, capitalism rather than patriarchy. They would argue that women reproduce the labour force simply through obviously having children. They make new workers and they also do this through their unpaid domestic labour. What does this mean? Well, they maintain their husbands. When their husbands come home from work, if they've had a particularly difficult day. Often they are the one who absorbs that frustration and dad or the husband is ultimately going to be restored, ready to go back to work to work the next day. Whereas perhaps if women didn't do this, men would be more likely to take their frustration out on capitalism or their bosses, the bourgeoisie, and this could help bring about change. Also, mum or the wife generally is the one socialising the next generation of workers, teaching them the norms and values of capitalism, preparing them for their future exploitation. So Marxist feminists again would say this all needs to stop because ultimately it's only going to further women's oppression and we're never going to get rid of capitalism. Ansley from 1972 argues that the emotional support provided by wives acts as a safety valve for their husband's frustration at working within the capitalist system. So again, husbands may be angry by their bosses exploiting them, but instead of doing something about it, their wives are absorbing that anger and therefore nothing ever changes. 
Feely argues, and once again in 1972, that the family is an authoritarian unit dominated by the husband. It teaches children to give in to parental authority and accept their place within a capitalist society. So again, it's performing an ideological fun function, preparing children to be exploited later in life. In order to end women's oppression, Marxist feminists would argue that the family must be abolished. The family is patriarchal, it's inherently capitalist, get rid of the family, you may stand a chance of destroying capitalism. Therefore, a socialist revolution needs to occur and a class of society needs to be created and only then will women enjoy equality and freedom. Radical feminism, as hinted at in the name, is a more radical form of feminism to both liberal feminism and, to an extent, Marxist feminism. They argue that all societies are founded on patriarchy, which is male domination, that men are the enemy or are women's enemy because they oppress and exploit women. Family and marriage are the key institutions in patriarchy and they are key to this oppression and exploitation. So, for example, men benefit from women's unpaid domestic labour in the home, childcare, cooking, cleaning and so on. Men also use the threat of violence to main, maintain control over their wives and girlfriends and sometimes they will uh, carry out that violence in the form of domestic abuse. Other times the threat is used simply to control women and keep them in their place within patriarchy. And so for radical feminists, this needs to be challenged, this needs to be changed, this needs to be undone. The family must therefore be abolished and they therefore advocate both separatism, that's the idea that women should break away from men and form women-only colonies, and political lesbianism, that women should for a period of time engage in lesbian relationships or same-sex relationships away from men in order to fulfil their sexual needs. Now, as you can probably imagine, this causes some difficulties, as we'll see in the criticisms. But the idea is, is that this lesbianism would be of a political format rather than necessarily of some sort of deep-seated, inbuilt lesbianism. Heterosexual sex is therefore sleeping with the enemy. If men are the enemy and you're engaging in heterosexual sex as a woman, you are sleeping with your enemy. And this led Germaine Greer to argue that instead we need to see the creation of matrilocal or all-female households. Very similar to that idea of all-female separate colonies. Purdy argued that women are disadvantaged by the fact that they have children. So by nature of the fact that they have children, this unfortunately in our society places them at a disadvantage because it involves a long-term commitment. You're going to be raising a child for most likely 18 years and also lots of energy, and it's very, very expensive. And we see that the cost of raising a child is rising year on year. Purdy states that women should take on a baby strike, that is, they should cease to have children in order for men to take women's demands for equality seriously. However, radical feminism has been criticised by liberal feminists such as Somerville, who argued, well, there's been some improvements, you know, that the plight of women has got better, they now enjoy many uh, equal standing with men in many different areas, although, of course, as previously intimated, there are some things that still need to improve. Moreover, heterosexual attraction, the idea that obviously that women may be sexually attracted to men, makes political lesbianism very unlikely and arguably unworkable. Difference feminism focuses on the differences between different women. It argues that we cannot and should not generalise about women's experiences within the family as all women have very different experiences from one another. So, for example, a middle class and a working class woman will have very different experiences of family life, just as a white woman and a black woman and so on. This view is criticised by other feminists who say that women do share many of the same experiences, that even if you were to compare black, white, middle class, working class and other types of women, maybe from different parts of the world. Yes, of course, there would be some differences, but broadly speaking, lots of their disadvantages in their experiences would be very similar. So, for example, there would be fewer job opportunities for all women. There is lower pay for all women. And therefore, the critics would argue that there is more that actually brings women together than divides them along the lines of difference. Next, we need to consider the personal life perspective. The personal life perspective on the family makes two basic criticisms of structural perspectives, such as functionalism, Marxism and feminism. They tend to assume that the traditional nuclear family is the dominant family type, which we know is no longer the case. 
They are all structural theories. That is, they assume that families and their members are simply passive puppets. That is, they do as they're told, manipulated by the structure of society to perform certain functions. The sociology of personal life is strongly influenced by interactionist ideas, such as labelling, and contrasts with structural theories. So it really zooms in on individuals and individual behaviours and meanings. Sociologists from this perspective believe that in order to understand families, we must start from the point of view of the individuals concerned and the meanings they give to their relationships. It's a micro view, zooming in to individuals. Carol Smart is the main person associated with this perspective. She rejects the supposed decline of family life, which in many ways is hypothesized by several of these structural theories. Instead, her approach prioritizes the bonds between people, the importance of memory and cultural heritage, the significance of emotions, both positive and negative, and how family secrets work and change over time. Again, it's about zooming into individual families and individuals and discovering their personal meanings that they attach to their actions and interactions. She draws our attention to a range of other personal or intimate relationships that are important to people, even though they may not be conventionally defined as a family. So this is breaking the rules somewhat about what we understand a family to be. These include all kinds of relationships that individuals see as significant and give them a sense of identity, relatedness and belonging, such as relationships with friends who might be like a sister or a brother to you. Fictive kin, and kin means family. Close friends who are treated as relatives, for example, your mum's best friend, who you call your auntie. Gay and lesbian chosen families made up of a supportive network of close friends, ex-partners and others who are not related by marriage or blood. Relationships with dead relatives who live on in people's memories and continue to shape their identities and affect their actions. Even relationships with pets. For example, Becky Tipper found in her study of children's views of family relationships that children frequently saw their pets as part of the family. In short, the family is not in decline, it is just very different and much more diverse, that is to say different and complex, than ever before. There are, however, some criticisms of the personal life perspective. Whilst it helps us to understand how people themselves construct and define their relationships as family, rather than imposing traditional sociological definitions of the family from outside, the personal life perspective can be accused of taking too broad a view. Critics argue that by including a wide range of personal relationships, we ignore what is special about relationships that are based on blood or marriage. So perhaps we're blurring the lines simply too much to make the concept of family almost meaningless. The personal life perspective rejects the top-down view taken by other perspectives. However, unlike functionalism, the personal life perspective recognises that relatedness is not always a positive thing. That's it. Thank you very much.